Hey guys, it's Susan and Cliff, and we are here reporting from Death Valley. We are doing a B and H event space takeover, and we are excited to be talking about the future of editing. It's us. Come on. <laughs> no, we're waiting for the intro. There's no intro. It's us. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, let's share our screen. We're excited because uh, we're doing our installation of the future of AI and the state of art, the art. So we're excited. Today is Cliff's specialty, the future of editing. And I'm going to let Cliff take it away because this is his wheelhouse. I don't know if you guys know, Cliff is an editing guru. He adds his secret sauce to everything. And with the help of AI, he is taking over the editing <laughs> world. So I'm going to uh, kind of throw it to you, Cliff. Thank you. So before we begin, um, I we have we already had a couple of questions about is this a real background? Uh, <laughs> this is this is very much a real background. I'll give you guys a, just a little bit of a toy here. Uh, we are in Death Valley right now, about to start our workshop. That's our truck camper rig behind us. Um, so we're really excited. It starts tomorrow. We have a, a great group of people, and what a beautiful time! What a beautiful place! And coming literally hot off the tails of spending a month in Norway. Uh, it's nice to be back and and wearing some it is. <laughs> lightweight clothes, not having to wear a jacket out here. So we're excited about it. Okay, the future of editing. Um, this is really exciting, right? This is what a lot of people ask about is, where do we go from here, right? We talked about camera technology last session. If you haven't seen that, I implore you to go check that out. Uh, and we have plenty of other segments to go through in the future as well. But this is a natural extension of what happens after we take the picture? And every photo that we look at, every photo that we see online in social media or in print has been edited to some capacity. So we don't have all the time in the world. Usually when I do my boot camps uh, with my students, it takes about 17 hours. So we've just slightly less time to work with today. Uh, but we wanna give you a background um, about what we can do and what's possible with editing. So while we're not gonna get into the nitty gritty details, a big part of this is to help you get into the know. That's a whole point of this series is being in the know of what's possible and where things are headed, right? So with that, we're going to show you a lot of the newer technology that exists in some of the most popular software, Lightroom, Photoshop. We have some third-party plugins and other software. Susan's going to demo as well. And we're just going to touch base on a few of the things that are really important for you to know because this saves you time. This makes your images look incredible. It brings out the true potential of your photos and knowing what to do and how to do it and the best way to do it is what this is all about. So we're going to talk a little bit uh, to give you a little bit of an overview, Lightroom, Photoshop. We're going to talk a little bit about Topaz AI, uh, Imogen, Evoto, which is a newer platform, Radiant Technology, which is doing these, these edits on a pixel by pixel level. Uh, and then we're going to open it up. We're going to talk about the future of editing and then a little bit of QA on the back end of this. So we'll be as quick as we can. And if you have questions, we are gonna breeze, breeze through this pretty quickly. Uh, just reach out to us. You can also, a lot of these uh, more in-depth tutorials will be on our website as well, the future of dot photography. So you can always go there to, to look for more information and reach out to us at any time. And we'll have our contact information up as well. All right, so to get started, um, the most popular software being used, and, and rightly so, by most photographers is Lightroom, right? So that's kind of my wheelhouse a little bit. And I would love to spend the next 10 hours with you demonstrating everything, but we just don't have time. And trust me, he could. <laughs> <laughs> I, I totally do. Uh, yeah, usually when I work with my students, it's like a three-hour session. Everyone's like, three hours? That takes forever. I'm like, it flies by, and it always does. So I'm going to be as as quick as I possibly can here. Uh, but some of the topics that are important for you to know. So if you don't know about any one of these, I, I, I truly encourage you to pay attention to this. And we're not going to show you how everything works, but it's important that you know that these things exist because this will save you time. This will make you more competitive. This will help you be more creative. And this will really bring out the best in your photos. Uh, so we're talking about Enhance, which is super resolution. That will increase the resolution of your photos. We'll be talking about AI masking. Um, that's a huge one. Uh, the denoise, the new denoise in Lightroom, AI denoise, is absolutely incredible. Uh, adaptive presets, quick removal tool, lens blur, dynamic presets, uh, auto adjust, Adobe Sensei, and then match total exposures. Those are just a few off the top of my head that I thought these are important. If someone was just coming into this, or you might have some experience doing a little bit of editing, 
you need to know that these exist and then you can Google further. Then you can go on YouTube. Then you can reach out to us for some more resources. So having said that, the best thing for me to do is simply just to show you what some of these things look like, because like they say, the proof is in the pudding, right? So let's get started with this. Uh, I'm going to bring up the, this right, right here. So we have a few images here. This is just a basic um, way to get started. I'm actually going to go ahead and stop my video for a second. You guys don't need to look at our beautiful background. We'll take a look at that. You can look at our photos instead. So here we have a, a series of images. And this often comes up quite a bit as, you know, we have a series of images that might have different exposures. Or how do we edit them, right? So right off the bat, I want to, I just want to show you something here. Auto adjustments have completely transformed photography. So Command U will auto adjust any picture at all. So think about Command U. I'm on a Mac, so Command, if you're on PC, it's Control. And that will auto adjust your exposure by default, right? So the reason why I use that shortcut, Command U, to save you time, is we can hit Command A to select all of them. And we can hit Command U, and that will auto adjust our pictures, right? So it'll, it'll, basically re reduce the highlights, bring up the shadows, but it does it in a very intelligent way. It's not just there to just reduce the highlights and shadows. It increases the contrast. It takes care of the blacks. It takes care of a lot of other adjustments. Now, what if I wanted to take it a step further, right? So I wanted to maybe white balance a photo. I can hit shift command U and that will white balance a photo a little bit, right? Now, if I wanted to take it further, you know, some of you might know some of these, but still, Pay attention a little bit. I can reduce the highlights a little bit. I can bring the shadows up just a little bit more. Maybe change the color temperature a little bit. Right? Actually, let's warm this up quite a bit. I'll add a little bit more saturation to it. And what I usually do is go into my color grading. And I like to add this Magic 39, as some of you may be familiar. It just adds a little bit more of a glow to our photo. So if I add, it just adds that like low angle, golden hour kind of light, right? So there's my before and there's my after. Now, the tip is if I select all of these, right? Then I can sync my settings here and I can sync my settings, right? And so it will just apply to all the pictures. Now you might notice though, it doesn't adjust for the exposures. And this is a question I get a lot was how do I adjust for exposures? Those of you who are shooting event photography or or just travel where the exposures can be all over the place. So if you're shooting street, right? And you have a subject that's in the light and then in the shadow. Um, there's a nice little shortcut, shift option, command M. That will match all of your exposures instantly. So the reason why I just wanted to show you this rather than talk about it is to really demonstrate the power of just knowing our tools. And to me, a big part of the future of editing is just being competitive, being able to really automate a lot of this. So we start from here, which the exposures are all the place. So we don't really like the color and we end up here. So just slowing you down for a sec, Cliff, for those who are just trying to keep up, what was the shortcut? Shift option, command M. That's a tough one. I get it. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to go to help <laughs> before you text or email me help. But if this still doesn't work, you can text or email me and you can just type in match, right? And this will show you where it is. Lightroom has one of the best search features of any program I've ever seen. It will show you where it is, and it will also show you the shortcut, right? So it really makes it easy to get there. So if you do this more than once, this is just a lifesaver. And honestly, this is a time saver, right? So we can sync our all of our adjustments, but then we can match exposures. And the reason why this is powerful is because if I take this and I say, you know what? I just want this to be a little bit brighter. No matter where the other exposures are, how dark or how bright they are, this will match them to that base exposure. So you just need to get one photo right and you can edit 100 photos at the same time. So that one's huge, right? I'm going to skip over this because I had another demonstration, but I think that really kind of gets the point across. Another really important one is enhance photos. So this is something that kind of flew under the radar, it kind of surprises a lot of my students when I show them this. So here we have a photo. I hit I for information. That's how you get the information at the top here. And we have a 20 megapixel image, which isn't bad, right? This is taken from a drone. But what if I need to crop into it? What if I need to print this larger? Or if any of you have made books before, for instance, you might get a little pop-up that says, hey, you don't have enough resolution to print this at the size you want. This is actually quite an easy fix. You can right click, right? And you can say uh, enhance right here. And what this will do is increase the resolution by 4x in a single click. 
So I want to throw this out there. When you're using like Mid Journey and those other text to photo generators, they don't have the highest resolution. So this is the perfect tool to use for that. Absolutely. If you're using cell phones, if you need to crop in, let's say you're out on safari and you only have your 200 or 400, but that animal is just a little further away or that bird. There's so many examples out here. Um, so this is what it looks like. This is the enhanced. And then this is a whole nother enhanced. And I know what you're thinking. I can't see the difference. <laughs> I get it. So if I hit C for compare, I'm going to let's, let's say I zoom into this, right? And this is a one for one right here. Right. So what I can do is turn off this lock and I can zoom in a little bit more. So here you should be able to really see the difference now of what that looks like. Right. So this is how we enhance the photo. Now, this is really good. Right. This is already this is such an easy, simple fix. And this is using AI to enhance our photos. But we can take it a step further. And if I go to this one now. And I hit C to compare. This is going to be too much, so I'll, I'll zoom back out for you a little bit. First of all, take a look at the resolution of this photo. Right? 512 megapixels. So this is using a third-party software code Topaz Gigapixel. And this will resize up to 6x with even better clarity. So natively, if you don't have to buy any other software. You can do this with just the, the photo enhance inside of Lightroom. But you'll see there's a lot more detail in here. If we go to um, maybe over here, you'll see the detail that gets enhanced like dramatically, right? And so this is using Topaz's Gigapixel. So think about all those old photos that you have or those older pictures that may have not had the best resolution or things you've cropped in that you want to print large. This is how you do it. So Topaz Gigapixel. You can start with Enhance. If that's not good enough, you go to Topaz gigapixel. It's truly incredible. And this kind of makes a point that when you have like a micro four thirds camera that may have a smaller resolution, if you can use software like this, why do you need to carry around a really heavy, big mirrorless camera? You can just be enhancing your photos to yeah. get more megapixels. So another example, I've worked with a commercial client and we're building a website. We're working with some of their older photos that are historic and they gave us. And here's a photo that's 1.5 megapixels, if you can see that. <laughs> so what am I supposed to do with that, right? Like we want to put this on a website. We want to make this more usable. So I enhance this to 50 megapixels. And again, you won't be able to see the difference until you zoom in a little bit. So let's just show you what that looks like here. I'm going to zoom into, let's just zoom into his shirt. Let's back that up just a little bit here. And I'll zoom in over here. This is, it feels like something out of like those science fiction TV shows where they're like enhance, you know, it's like a crime scene and look at the mm -hmm. license plate, but this is, this is a real deal. I mean, we have, look at this difference in resolution here. It's pretty remarkable. So again, think about all those older photos where when we ever have these conversations, we just came off the floor of WPPI last week. We have these conversations about resolution and cameras. How much resolution do we really need? It's just something to consider. Maybe you have enough. And if you have a photo that exists that you need to really enhance more, now you know you have the technology available to you to do it. You can start with Enhance, and then you can go over to Topaz Gigapixel or Topaz Photo AI. That is a question we get too. So Photo AI is basically a software that incorporates the Gigapixel, which is the resize, and the Sharpen and the Denoise all in one. All right, so it's a little bit cheaper, and it brings all those in, and it does a really good job, especially the newer version. Okay, moving on. Um, the next really cool feature is, is uh, not Topaz Denoise. Actually, that's cool too, but now it's natively built into Lightroom. So I want to show you another example here. It's really hard to shoot hummingbirds, especially early in the morning, and they move pretty fast. <laughs> so we need an extremely astronomically high ISO. So how do we use this? What if we turn that photo into this? Right, I'm gonna go ahead and hit C to compare. And I'll bring this up so we can really see what this looks like. And I'll zoom in quite a bit because I know through Zoom sometimes it gets compressed. Take a look at that, right? It takes a photo that would otherwise be deemed unusable by most photographers to a photo that's completely usable. It's not just removing noise at this point, it eliminates it. It completely 
Previously to this, if anyone's used noise removal, especially inside of Lightroom, uh, there's a reason why there's so many third-party plugins, right? <laughs> it kind of sucked, to be honest with you. It, all it did is sort of blur the picture, which is why it's in the detail panel, because you'd have noise reduction, you have sharpen, because they would compensate for each other. Now, the noise reduction removes the noise and actually enhances the photo at the same time. So it's a completely different experience. And know this, right? Because again, this goes back to, do we need a lot of resolution in our cameras to create amazing photos? I don't know anymore. Do we need extremely high ISO noise capability? Uh, I don't know about that either, right? A lot of this is being solved through computational photography, right? So take a look at this. It's the same thing. That noise is completely removed. Uh, there's another example here. I think Susan will talk about this because this is one of your photos. Sure. So we were in Venice doing a photo shoot with no extra light. This is like at no nighttime. And we had this beautiful model. In order to even see her in the darkness, we had to shoot at a really high ISO. And, uh, you know, I thought, okay, these pictures look like pretty much garbage. But when we ran them through noise reduction on Lightroom, it was amazing the color that came back. This one is, uh, yeah, this one, one's the quality of her skin, the softness of her skin, and the details that came back. And just want to show you even colors on her dress that we didn't even see in the previous version came back. And I thought, wow, that's really powerful. Show yeah, you the let me show you the, what that looks like when we have that synced, because it is pretty remarkable. Like you can see that, right? So what we did from there was we took it and we sharpened it inside of Topaz because we don't have an AI sharpening yet. Maybe by the time some of you are watching this, hopefully by that time we do. So we I'll just go back to her face here and we sharpened it a little bit. So you'll see it says Topaz Sharpen up in the, the metadata info, the name. And here you can see if someone showed me the image on the left was taken by the camera A, and the image on the right was taken by camera B. And the camera B cameras, oh, by the way, $10,000 more. I would seriously consider it. I'd be like, well, I'm a professional. I have paying clients. I need the best image quality. It's the same photo. It's the same camera. <laughs> and then to go back to what you are saying before about, I mean, look at the detail in this dress here and the colors that it's pulling out. It's, it's remarkable how good of a job it does. So you need to know about this stuff. That's the point. We don't, we're don't. we not going to show you every last little detail of all this. We're happy to. I do boot camps. Uh, you know, we have a photo retreat coming up this summer. We do a lot of training and online stuff. That's not, that's not why we're here. We're here to remove the blind spot so you're in the know about what's possible now. Because the conversation we're going to continue to have, and we're going to dedicate a whole, I think, segment on this, is, is AI going to replace our, our jobs, our work, our livelihood? And I think in the short term, at least, the answer is no. But what is going to happen is other photographers using AI will take your jobs, will take your work, will take your livelihood because they're using the tools. So it's really important that you know about these tools. So our workflow typically is to bring it into Lightroom, use a noise reduction, and then if we need to, then we bring it into Topaz AI. Yeah. Um, because Susan's a night photographer, we had to include a couple of these. And if we really zoom in here, you'll be able to see the difference. The one I mean, on the left is a sharpened one, so yeah. you can tell. Right. So it's completely a different photo at that point. It's sharpening, it's removing the noise. Um, you know, it makes you consider, well, do we need to do image stacking all the time at least? Right. One more example here. And this should be a pretty drastic difference for many of you too. And this is shot at ISO 100 because we expose at night a little bit darker and then bring up so we don't um, blow out the highlights. And so you're dealing with the noise that gets uh, that, that occurs when you lift the shadows. And look at the difference between them. It's 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 pretty remarkable, All right? So just a couple other examples there. All right, next up, masking. Right, this is what a lot of people talk about. And oh man, this is so cool. This has completely shifted the way I approach photography at this point. This has completely shifted uh, the way I teach it, the way I, I use Lightroom on a daily basis. And this saves more time and more effort and helps me be more creative than any other single thing that's ever been included in Lightroom. It's extremely powerful. Let me show you a couple things that we want to talk about. Uh, one, so masking is instant, right? We can click on this mask icon here and I can say, let's just select the sky. 
we have an instant mask for the sky. Now, if I hit O for overlay, you'll see what that does. All right, so here we're not gonna do much. It's just there to show you what we can do. Because we have a couple of people here, and these are uh, true to life astrophysicists that we met in the mountains of Norway, uh, space engineers. Dolomites. Dolomites. I have Norway on my mind still. <laughs> uh, we're gonna do, instead of select subject, which we could do, we're gonna go ahead and select people because this is a really cool feature. And it, some of you may have heard about this, but unless you've really kind of dug into the details, you may not realize all the options that we have. So first of all, we can select all people at once, which is pretty cool, right? And then we can say, all right, I just want to select their face skin and then go to the texture slider and reduce that a little bit, right? We can select their face and their body skin. So we can combine a lot of these. So now, now this is like, there should be light bulbs going off with a lot of event photographers, a lot of portrait photographers. Um, you know, now we can just shift the color hues of their face a little bit. If the lighting's a little off without affecting, maybe you're working for a magazine or, you know, the color of the clothes is really important. Um, but other ones too. And if I hover over this, you're going to see, I'll probably need to zoom in a little bit, but we can select their, just their clothes, for instance, right? And we can maybe sharpen that or adjust their hair and give them purple hair. <laughs> <laughs> No, but you, you see the point, right? So this is extremely powerful. And at once we can select everything and we can create a mask of just them. And for instance, now we can just, you know, bring up the shadow detail a little bit, which I kind of already did. And another cool thing, here's like a little bonus tip is we can select these little three dots here and I can duplicate an inverse and now I can darken everything else that's not them, right? So we'll do that subtly, but you'll see how we can shift the focus and shift the light in a really powerful, intuitive way. And that's the point of this. It helps you go from point A to point B in a much faster, much more effective, much more intuitive way. So we can work on the creative things, right? Our vision, not just how we get there, but where we're going. That's what this is all about. Okay, a uh, couple others. Masking, this is just so cool. Uh, let's do another one here. I'm gonna go ahead and click on this icon again. And I'll get rid of this. So that's selected for her skin. And you know what? Let's talk about her shirt for a second, right? So I want to select people. I can select subject too, but I'm going to go to people. And let's just do her clothes this time. And I'll say create mask. And now I can just play with the color temperature, like instant. You know, it's not that this would be impossible before, but think about how difficult that would have been to do before. And then I can go back again and I can say, all right, let's select people again. And then let's just maybe brighten up her skin a little bit. So we give a little contrast. So let's just do facial skin and body skin. There we go. And now we can maybe just brighten that up a little bit. So these masks are really powerful. Now, again, we can select the person. Select the entire person. Invert it this time. And then darken everything else around. That's pretty cool. But what if I wanted to do this? What if I wanted to darken the right-hand side? What if I wanted to darken the left-hand side, actually? Because there's still, it's too distracting. I'm going to hit M. That's a shortcut for a linear gradient. I'll hold the shift key down so I get a vertical. So it stays perfectly vertical. It doesn't feel like I've been drinking too much when I try and apply this. And you know what? Let's just apply this all the way across more. And I'm just going to darken this down a little bit. And you'll notice that it's affecting her. I don't want it to. All I need to do is click on the mask subtract and subtract let's do subject this time that should recognize the subject there we go right and you'll see what that did there it darkened the background without affecting her right that's really powerful so ai masking and this is just scratching the surface extremely extremely powerful stuff um one more i'll probably show you in fact i'm going to skip this one there's i think there's a cooler one here we just came back from norway so I want to show you the difference between these two images here and then walk you through some of the masks that were created for this. So first of all, you might know the water blur. Um, what I did for that, instead of using an ND filter, is I would stack the multiple long exposures, multiple short exposures, actually. Uh, and then I blended them together in Photoshop to give me that long exposure. All right, so that's how you get that effect. And I'll show you what we did to create what, what, what I call motivated light. That's what they call in cinema is motivated light. So let's bring out the masks. And rather than do all these, because we don't have enough time, I'm just going to hide these. 
so you can see what they look like and why I make the decisions I do. So you get a little bit of peek behind the scenes of what goes into enhancing a photo. And I have a whole uh, course basically on how to make our photos look the best, you know, part of the ultimate workflow. And a lot of it is what I call the visual roadmap of understanding how people view images. So let me move this over just a little bit. And so now I'm creating, you'll see here as I start building these masks, you'll start, you'll see I start building that sky. And I'll turn this off even. So first of all, this is using a radial gradient. And I apply multiple radial gradients at the same time. Show them. I think right? it's important. Show them one. Okay. I'll show you. So I'll create a radial gradient here, shift M. And I'm going to hold option and command. And I'll drag a few of them out there. And if I hit clarity and a little bit of whites and a little bit of warmth, right? And I'll just go to my amount slider now. You'll see what that does. Right. So I'm applying chiatoscura, right? Susan can pronounce that better than I because she's Italian. <laughs> right? I hope that's right. Nice try. Nice try. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but it, it's enhancing the light on a photo in really interesting ways, as if the sun kind of poked through the clouds. But it's way more dynamic rather than just doing something like this, where we can just select for the sky, for instance. And one way you can do it, and I would invert that and I just brighten the whole, that's not as interesting, right? So I wouldn't do that. So I would just start building my masks. So here we go. And I build another one and I build another one. And now I'm creating that light source on the right-hand side. And yeah, you can rename them too. Now I'm building that again. So I build it in stages. Now I'm adding a little bit more warmth. So I'm creating what's called motivated light. And now you'll see the mountain in the background here. I'm adding a little detail to that. And you'll see that mask that I created. And so how I would do that, for instance, I might as well show you that too, is I would select this area like this. Now we're thinking that's like the worst selection ever. But here's all you need to do. Here's all you need to do is subtract the sky from that selection. And now I have a selection of just that area. I can say, all right, well, I know that the light source is coming from the right-hand side. So why don't I subtract with a linear gradient the light on the left? And now... I warm this up and I'll go to my mount slider here. I'm creating a light that looks like it's coming from the right hand side. Right? So it's very intuitive once you get the hang of this. And as we add more lights, you'll see that starts to come alive more and more. There's a sky. So again, I create a gradient on the sky and I would, and I would just refine that. So I'll show you that quickly too. Gradient on the sky there. Let's darken that too much just so you can see what that looks like. And I could either subtract this object over here, right? Or I can just say, hold the option key and hit, I say refine, it says intersect, but that sounds like too much math. So I'm going to say refine. And I'm going to say refine that just to the sky. And then now I just have a selection of that sky. I can change the color, for instance, and make it more moody with a little dehaze, right? So I'm starting to build this more and more. And you'll see those other layers start coming alive until we have a photo that we're happy with, All right? And so we go a photo from, that looks like this, to a photo that looks like this. And to be honest, that light was technically there. He's just enhancing it and kind of making it really more there. Yeah. Enhancing it a little bit. Yeah, exactly. And everything is non-destructive here. So if you wake up in the next morning and realize, oh, I went too far with that, you can back that down very easily, All right? There's a lot more of that, but there's still a lot more to cover. So we're going to move on. Uh, lens blur. Um, this is a really cool feature here. In fact, let's go to this one, because this we just took of our buddy Tool Vagar as a blacksmith out in Norway with his son, who we met for the first time. Uh, and I thought this was so cool. So we're in their workshop, and I just want to show you what that looks like. So we have our lens blur here. And I'm going to turn that off, because it's a very busy scene in their workshop. right? You can see all the distractions in there. And if I hit I for information, you'll see some of my settings. So I shot this at 2.5, but still, I wanted more separation. So all I had to do was click on, it's his early access, but lens blur. And then I just enhance this all the way, but it's it's instantly going to figure out what the subject is and remove the background. Well, not remove it, just blur it. So it's almost like you're shooting with the lens that's instead of an F4, an F2.8, or an F2. So think about, again, camera technology. Right? Can we use software 
to overcome some of the limitations of, well, I'd much prefer to carry uh, 100, 400, 5, 6 instead of a 400, 2, 8, right? <laughs> or a 7200 F4 instead of a 2, 8, right? So, and it's a lot cheaper too. It's a lot um, lighter probably. A lot lighter to carry around. <laughs> so now we have, but the cool thing is we have a lot of flexibility with this. So we can come in here and let's say we didn't like how it applied to this bell on the left. I can actually come in here and I can apply more blur and I can brush in blur where I want it or I can brush out. And I can say, no, I actually want, actually let's remove this in the background. Let's just blur that a little bit and you'll see how that instantly blurs that background. Can't do that in camera, right? If you miss the focus, you miss the shot. Here, now we're starting to get the point where AI is starting to understand the depth in the scene and the single click allowing us to create a depth of field effect and it's only going to get better right so this is really important to know especially those of you shooting with smaller sensors or on iphones for instance you don't necessarily need to shoot in portrait mode because portrait mode slows you down you can't shoot raw there's a lot of reasons why now we have full creative control right and there's a few other examples here um, you'll see that example there and this one as well so especially if you're in like a busy scene like this, this is the Halloween parade in New York City where there's so many distracting elements and you really want your subject to pop. This is a perfect opportunity to blur the background. And I didn't have the, actually I actually did have a pretty fast lens. And even at f2.2, I was still getting a lot of distraction elements. So yeah. by using this blur effect, you're able to hide the people and the lights and just make the beautiful moth girl uh, shine. <laughs> so cool. So like people didn't even recognize her. So didn't recognize because, her as a yeah, person. Exactly. I can't <laughs> blame her. Doesn't know what it is. So we can select an object, for instance, so, right? And then we can invert this and maybe just make the background a little bit cooler. You see how instantly that changes the photo a little bit. So now we're trying to separate her out from the background and we use multiple tools in order to do that. Okay, so that covers... A lot of what I want to talk about, um, dynamic presets, I didn't mention that, so I could. Basically, if you're in the develop panel, um, you can create a preset. I'll hit tab key so I can show this up here. And I can say, all right, create a preset for this. And I'll say Halloween, right? Portrait, if I can spell it. There we go. And maybe I put it under, not landscapes, but I put it under, let's do it under... Um, for now, let's do a new group. Why not? And I'll say portraits. So just you can see how you can organize things. Okay. Now I'm going to have options of what to do. Oh, I already have one there. There we go. You can select all of these, right? But you also have an option for masking. And this is what's interesting. This is why we call it dynamic masking or AI masking is because the subject's going to move. You're going to have a different subject. The sky is going to be a different place, right? On and on. Your object's going to change. You can apply, you can save presets now and apply them in a way that it will know what your subject is. It will recognize the person, it will recognize the sky and apply that dynamically to the next photo. This is why I never used presets too much before. Now I'm starting to use them way more often, right? Because we can apply them in really meaningful ways and allow for the AI masking to compensate for that subject movement or a totally, completely different subject. So all of your presets just got a huge upgrade using AI. Uh, really, really powerful to be able to do that. And Lightroom has some default, what they call adaptive presets too. So how did you get to that cliff? Kind of glanced over that. Uh, the presets? Yep. You can just hit this plus icon here. There you go. Yeah, you can create your own preset. And just so you know, Lightroom has their, what they call adaptive presets. And it's fun to play around with if you don't know about this before. So adaptive subject, right? Make the subject pop. Uh, adaptive sky. And just hovering over it, it's going to tell you what it does. It recognizes the subject. This is even before you create a mask. Uh, really cool. Adaptive sky, great for landscapes, adaptive portraits. Here's all the different things you can do just by hover. So just something to know. We're not going to get into all the details. We have plenty more to cover. Um, but I wanted to really talk about that a little bit more. Uh, quick removal tool. Uh, I can briefly cover that. Let's maybe grab this one over here. And let's say we want to remove, uh, I don't know, let's, let's remove an object. Let's zoom in a little bit. Yeah, let's say we just want to remove this little dot. If I hit Q for quick removal, right? It's called the removal tool, but I say quick removal. And I'm going to hit the bracket key to make this smaller. All right, we'll just choose an easy one here. Now, you'll notice there's a new option. And this is using content 
aware healing, essentially. Um, we didn't have this before, content aware technology inside our Lightroom. Now we do. So if I click on it, it's going to remove this. It's you know it's not that big of a of a deal to do it. I'll just increase the opacity here, and it will remove it. But it can start doing some really interesting things and removing a lot of detail. So maybe just that over there, right? These little details you can remove. And you'll notice that we don't have to sample from other parts of the image. That's the really cool part. We don't need to sample any part of the image anymore to remove. It'll just do it just like it does in Photoshop. And it does a really good job. It's not generative fill, but it does a really good job of removing some of those distractions. Okay. Uh, Lensburg, Dynamic Producers, Auto Adjust. Okay. I think we covered everything I want to talk about in Lightroom. Now we enter Photoshop. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> I just learned how to do that this morning. It was ridiculous. Okay. Generative Fill. What do you, what do you think about this? So Generative Fill is changing the game for us landscape photographers or anybody who needs to fill in a corner that maybe they didn't crop it right. So there's so many things you can do here. So, but... yeah, this kind of blew my mind, right? Um, we go to we go to Italy at least twice a year. We do workshops in Venice and the Dolomites. And I used to get so stressed out uh, because there's so many people there that it makes it difficult. Unless you get up early in the morning or shooting night photography portrait shoots, which is incredible with our models. Um, but there's still there's quite a few people here, and so you can either be the grumpy photographer, it's like get out of my way. That's not going to happen. There's just too many people. Right? So a couple things. One, distortion. This is going to happen anytime you're shooting in the city and you're looking up at something that's called keystone distortion. And yes, you can fix that inside of Lightroom um, quite easily, actually. Right? We go to transform. I can hit auto. Maybe it gets me most of the way there, but then I can just go to vertical. And I can shift this to a point until I'm, I'm happy with it. Right? And then maybe go to aspect ratio and Maybe make it just a little bit taller and then I can go to rotate and I can I can kind of get it to a point where I'm happy with it, but then look what happens, right? It's a problem because, well, now what? Well, we don't if have I that crop data. This, yeah. Right? Now we just lost all this data. So I want it to look like I'm shooting this straight on, right? And that's kind of the, this photo here. But how do we do that? Because we just lost the corners. So what we're going to do is fill in those corners. And this is a really practical application that all photographers can use because we're all in that situation where you can't put your feet or your camera in the perfect position to get the photo that you want. And plus there's all these other, you know, annoying people. What, what a colleague of mine calls um, PPRs, professional picture ruiners, right? So we're going to remove them, right? So what you do is you bring this into Photoshop. Command E is the shortcut for that. See if I have, I should have Photoshop open. There we go. And a couple of ways you could do it. I use L for lasso. And here's the thing. You can just drag this. It'll do a pretty good job, but it might be a little difficult sometimes. And it might look like you've maybe had a little too much to drink or you need a nap, <laughs> right? So instead, I'm going to start with a lasso tool. I'm going to hold the option key down. And that allows me to create a straight line, straight line, straight line. And there we go. Now here's the magic. In fact, I'm going to do the same thing here. Just for maximum impact. I'm going to do the old school way. So some of you might not remember that shortcut. There we go. And maybe we'll just add a little bit down here because we missed that little section here. There we go. And I'm going to hit generate fill and generate again. Now I wouldn't actually do it this way. Some of you might be thinking that is because there's a minimum, there's a limit to the resolution that we have at the moment. Right. So you want to do section at a time because each section has that limit applied to it. So I would do it in two stages, one stage and then two stages, and maybe the one on the bottom. Because we don't have a lot of time here and I want to demonstrate the effect, um, you'll see just like how good of a job it's really going to do. And you're not stuck with any of these, by the way. You can do this as many times as you want until you get the result that you're looking for. Uh, it usually takes about 20 seconds or so. We are in the middle of the desert. Keep that in mind. Also doing a Zoom call. <laughs> but it'll get there eventually. There you go. Right. And then if I turn that off, it, you wouldn't even know that. Yeah. Look, that it was looks done. pretty good. <laughs> and then you can hit this arrow here and you can try a couple other examples. So I think this looks pretty good here. Now, another tool I want to demonstrate for you quickly as I'll hit this little plus icon here, if I can see that in the shade and there's another tool. I don't want to get rid of that bird, but you want to get rid of some people here. 
All right. Now you might see that my bar is a little bit different than yours. That's because I set up my mine and my students' uh, toolbar with all the most important tools on the top left. So we don't have to worry about all these ones on the bottom here. If you have questions about that, just shoot me an email. I'll show you how to do it. Here's a remove tool, right? And what we can do is just start painting. We want to remove, and we could do several of them. So I'm not going to get too crazy with this, but let's just do a couple more. And I'll hit the checkbox. Gone. All right. And we can go on and on with this. It's great for smaller things, especially. You know, I'd probably use a lasso tool and the gen fill for a lot of this otherwise, but it'll get the job done really well. And check. And keep on going until you're kind of happy with this. All right. So I think you guys get the idea. Uh, really, really powerful stuff. And you can even get more powerful than that, right? We can go to our marquee tool, for instance, and start removing, well, there's this pesky little fence in the way there. What would happen if we just generated something else? Like this is getting crazy, but you see the power of this to be able to remove the obstacles. Now it is called gen fill. So yeah, you can fill it in with something else. I, I don't necessarily use it that way. Uh, I much prefer to use it to remove objects. I think that's the much better use case for most photographers. But again, every time Photoshop comes out with something, uh, we'd probably run this a couple of times because um, I can actually remove that if I did this, if I did like a large enough section, for instance. Um, but there's much more to cover. Um, but you'll see that artists always use Photoshop and all the tools that they release in a very different direction than as they were intended. So GenFill, again, I think it's, better for gen removal than anything else. Okay, we'll let that run. Um, and so that's how we get to a photo that looks like that from there. So it's nothing to stress about anymore if there's people in your shot, if there's distractions in your way, if there's telephone poles, that kind of thing. Uh, another example, we've got for series, one of my clients I shoot out in Sedona and we took that photo, which is great, but they were like, well, you know, what can we do? In fact, they didn't even ask. I just put this together and they were really surprised by this. And then you'll see here from a gen fill perspective, well, I just put a golf cart in there. It's after hours. There shouldn't be any golf carts on there. But I wanted a focal point in the image. And the second night I showed them this, they made they made business cards the next day. It was kind of crazy. Um, but you go from an image that looks like this, which is a good foundation. And yeah, you, you can get into the ethics and we'll, we have a whole presentation on that. But if you just pause that for a second, you're thinking from a commercial photographer, you're getting hired to deliver a result to a client, right? You're 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 hired to create magic on demand. And if your vision is to have something and then have it look a certain way, you'll notice that I put a sky in there as well. And I was careful to match the direction of the light. Um, you can create what clients are looking for, right? So we can go down that rabbit hole a little bit, maybe another time about what's a photograph versus an image. But when you're when from a commercial standpoint, my clients are extremely pleased with this. Another example. Um, here I have just a pano I shot for them and that was a result and they loved it. They, you know, it's a new real estate campaign and they wanted some beautiful aerial shots, which is great. I wasn't happy though. I didn't like how there wasn't continuity on the bottom. So I just created it, right? That's all I needed to do is I filled that in. That's content aware or gen fill, sorry. And that just gives me a little bit more continuity of closing that gap of the water. Uh, a few other examples in our model in Venice. You'll see just removing that light. And this is a really practical example too, right? You, if you've ever used lighting before, you may notice that the light looks better the closer you get because of the relative size to your subject. But we get to a point where it starts to become in the frame. And if you want an environmental portrait, so you have a slightly wider angle lens, that becomes an issue. So you can either back up your light, but then you lose the power and you lose the quality of the light because relatively it gets smaller, more specular. Or you can just keep the light source in there a little bit and remove it later. So you get the best of both worlds. All right. Another example here, replacing the sky, removing our, our light source. And it just gives us, it helps us achieve the vision that we want to achieve. And that's what this is all about. How do we achieve the vision that we want to achieve? Here's another example, All right? I had this vision, but I could not, trust me, you do not want to step foot in the water in Venice. Uh, so this is the vision that I had. I want to remove a couple of people and I could have removed more too. It's just there as an example. Um, but that's what that looks like. So that's just a kind of a brief overview 
of GenFill and what that will look like and the applications behind it. Um, Gen Expand is another really cool feature. I'll hit Command E and I'll send this over. See if I can bring this up here. Now look at that. I actually removed the wall back there. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so what Gen Expand will do is I'll make this a little bit smaller. I'll hit C for crop. Right? And I can clear this. And I'm just going to, let's say I want a little bit more on the sides here. Just a little bit more and a little bit more up top. Right? I'm just reframing this image the way I, the way I want. Uh, and before I do that, in fact, I'm going to bring this up and I'm going to create just another layer here. There we go. Now I'm going to add a little bit more room on the top and to the right. A little bit more room on the left. I just want a little bit more breathing room. And what's what you have to be careful of, instead of background default, you want to say generative expand. Right? And that's what's going to combine the cropping out instead of cropping in and start filling the frame to just basically complete the photo as if it was shot with a wider lens in the first place. Uh, it's pretty remarkable how this works. You could do it manually, but it just saves you an extra step of having to make multiple selections and then filling it in with generative fill. So this is such a powerful tool for you guys to know if if you're not familiar with it. Um, and if you tried it, just make sure it says background or generative expand up top, and that will expand it for you and does just a remarkable job. So if you're shooting an image and let's say you cut off part of the image or just not enough breathing or you shoot this wildlife photo, but they're looking in the wrong direction. Just know that you have options, right? That's what this is all about is that you're aware that you have options. So there's your generative fill. Uh, object selection. We'll talk about that briefly. Uh, oh, just a couple other examples here for the golf course, right? You'll see that again, like you can't control all the variables when you're a professional photographer, you have to make magic on demand, right? And this is a scene I always want to get, but there's that pesky little taxi stand in the way, so I just removed it. A group photo, look at all those professional picture ruin those PPRs in the background, gone. We're the only people now in San Marco, right? And on and on and on, right? So that's just a really clever and easy way to, intuitive way to get rid of some photos. Now, speaking of this, I'm going to send this over. Let's send a copy of this over. There we go. Another tool that's really handy to know about is your object selection tool. I'm not going to demo this too much. Just, just to show you, here's how easy it is to make masks and selections now. You just hover over the thing. I'll have commands here so you can see that. You hover over anything that you want to make a selection of, and it will make a perfect selection. And you just click. That's it. Right, so there's your object selection tool. Enough said about that. <laughs> sky replacement, I, I showed you the sky replacement. It is incredibly easy to do. Um, if we were gonna bring this into Photoshop here, right? All you need to do is go to edit and sky replacement. Where are you? Sky replacement. And that's it. You can obviously choose your own sky and you can replace it with everything else. Um, you want to match a little bit. So that, yeah, that will look a little fake, but just bear with me for a second. When you do that, I'm going to go to our opacity and drag that down just a little bit, right? And that's how I usually work with it is I'll just bring the opacity down and just blend it so it's not as obvious. And it just gives me a little bit more texture in the sky than we had before, right? So I would, you know, obviously choose more carefully select the sky, but just there to show you how easy it is. That's in one click. Uh, and then neural filters too. So the last thing I'll just mention as far as that goes is I'll hit the tab key here. And you could do some really interesting things. There's our sky replacement in that photo, by the way. Uh, neural filters. So I'll just briefly show you this. I grabbed this image from stock to show you a couple things. Right? Now, it's very easy to remove that logo. It's something you need to know about. It's not something I need to show you, but it's something you know that people can do. But look what we did to colorize this photo, right? That is using the neural filters inside of Photoshop. And it's remarkable how well this works. 
Uh, and you'll notice something else too. If I go in a little bit closer here and I zoom in, I'll unlock this so I can really show you. We used a lot of what I showed you today to completely transform a photo. Now look at the resolution, look at the color, look at the sharpness, look at the noise, look at her eyes. Her eyes are looking at us now, right? We don't have enough time to really go into the neural filters and try to show you how to do that necessarily. But think about the tears of joy when you showed images like this for the next holiday or a birthday party with old friends and family members and loved ones. You can restore images now with the power of AI in a way that will truly move people to tears. I think show them real quick how you, the, the one feature and the neural filter. Oh, that's a rabbit hole. Oh, no. <laughs> Uh, let's see if I have that. Yeah, here we go. I do have that loaded up here. Um, I'll show you what that looks like in the different layers. Okay, right, see, so, so we get rid of that that watermark, and I'm filling in. If I hit Command Zero, I'm filling in the top. I just wanted to expand out a little bit to give them more breathing room. Um, then we added the color. All right, I'll show you how to do that. <laughs> get excited! I want everyone to see. <laughs> and then this is the the really creepy and crazy part is when we redirect her eyes. There's an actual an option to do this. Um, so let me show you what that will look like because it's it's pretty wild. If you go to filter and you go to neural filter. So this is like a neural network is the way our brains work, right? This is where all the AI lives inside of Photoshop and will recognize the different faces. And if you go to, let's say, Smart Portrait, for instance, and we turn that on, you have options to, like if we grab her face, for instance, we can say, um, let's make her not as happy, All right? And it will actually like change the happiness, which is crazy. You'll have the colorize option here, right? That's what I turned on before. You'll have depth blur, which is similar to what we have in Lightroom now. So you have a whole bunch of options and there's a whole more coming up in this wait list here. Um, but now we can change a lot about the photo, right? Just right in here. So here you have it, that different expression, which is just wild to me. So we can turn that on and off, make someone happier. And we can do that for photo by photo by photo. Change the hair, change the eye direction, which is what I did here. So let's make her look a little bit more to the right. So creepy, but, but like really effective at the same time. If again, you're a professional, you're getting hired to deliver results and you're shooting a group portrait and it's amazing, but so, one person isn't looking in the right direction. Think about that. There's some really cool options here. So, or to take like a family heirloom photo and then colorize it and give it to like your grandmother for, you know, the holidays or birthday gift. It's just amazing what you can do nowadays with just a simple click. Yeah. It's, it's really powerful. Remarkable. So, like, these are really practical. It doesn't have to be always commercial work or professional. You could do this right now with family members and totally transform like their day, right. their month, or their year with something like this. So, real impact here. All right, so that covers a lot of the Photoshop stuff. I know it took a while, but man, and there's more to cover. Uh, we will be doing more of this. We have our boot camp. We have our, our retreat we're doing this summer out in Sedona. Um, and then on our website too, we have a lot more um, tutorials on this as well. So so if you like what Cliff was throwing down, you definitely need to follow him because he <laughs> is always sharing his tips and tricks. It's I really try. powerful. I try. Spread the word a little. Evangelize. So... <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Next one, Luminar Neo. No, no, I'm gonna. I know go. we're not gonna talk about it, but we don't have time. But know that this plugin is. is I think it, they they dub themselves as the world's first fully truly AI everything plugin, and it does some really cool things. So the sky replacement is great. It does maybe a slightly better job with than um, Photoshop because it it puts reflections in the water. Um, the sun rays is incredible. Studio lighting will relight in 3D space. Generation expands something somebody can do in Photoshop. The relighting is kind of cool. The auto dust spot and power line removal is really cool. So you can put an image in there if you have a lot of dust spots or a lot of power lines. In one click, it will remove most of it. It's not that would perfect. save a lot of time for yeah. me. Oh my oh. god, totally. So when everyone freaks out about power lines, especially our students, we go to like when we do the workshop in Mexico. There's power lines everywhere. I'm like I don't even see them anymore. I I literally don't even see them anymore. So it's it's not it's a non-issue. And some other cool things that you should know about. So definitely check it out. It's kind of cool. Um, Topaz, we demoed this a little bit for you today, right? We talked about the resize. 
the gigapixel to sharpen the denoise. I slightly prefer, I don't know how you feel, but I slightly prefer the noise reduction in Lightroom. I do too. I kind of like the combo of the denoise into the AI sharpen in Topaz. Yeah. So I kind of like that combination. But, but the, exactly. Because the sharpen is still, I think, the best in the biz. And the gigapixel still is too. Um, and so Photo AI builds all that into a single package. It's kind of cool to know about. All right. So we're going to jump on to something that maybe you might not be as familiar with. This is called Imagine. And what is great for it is it's great for taking lots of images. Let's say you're a wedding photographer, or portrait photographer, you know, and you're tired of culling or you want to have a certain look. Well, Imagine is like an AI powered photo editing solution for Lightroom. So it basically teams up with Lightroom and it can, it learns your personal style and then saves it back. And basically you're uploading your images and then you get your images back with your style. So AI is learning how you edit and then putting, saving you tons of time. So I'm just diving into this software and I think it's really cool. When you start this program, it actually says, hey, do you want to use like AI from other professional talented people. So if you look at this list right here, it's kind of tiny to see, but you have um, wedding professionals like Michael Anthony and also Charmy Patel Pena and like even people like uh, Susan Stripling who are all like amazing portrait and wedding photographers. You can use their styles. It's kind of like their profiles on your images. So I recommend trying out this software. Um, first, you could use their profiles that are easily accessible. Then you can build your own. And the way it works is you have to upload a minimum of 3,000 images. And these are images that you've edited in Lightroom. They can't be the JPEGs. They have to be the smart previews or the raw images. And what it's learning is, is how you use your white balance, your temperature, t tint and tone, your exposure, contrast, highlights. Obviously, you could read the whole gamut. But it's basically looking at how you edit your pictures and understanding your style. But let's say you have a couple different styles that you like to use. So maybe for your weddings, you like them to be light and airy. But for your portraiture, you like to have like dark and dark and moody. So you can actually create multiple profiles with the way you edit. So you can actually go ahead and, and just hit, hey, I want my dark and moody profile. And then when you upload your images, it'll put that on there. So it's actually saving you tons of time. So when you've created your personal AI profile, you can start editing your pictures right away. Um, basically, it does it right away. You upload your pictures, it puts on your, your editing profiles, and it takes about 33 seconds per photo. So that means if you take a thousand, if you upload a thousand photos, it'll take five minutes to complete. Can you imagine? Also, if you do selecting such as straightening and cropping, it might take a double the amount of time, but you know, whatever, 10 minutes. I mean, I would take that if I had a thousand images to edit and it was going to put my secret sauce on it. I mean, it's pretty amazing. And as long as you did not move your Lightroom Classic catalog and your photos from a location, they'll be downloaded right back into your Lightroom catalog. So I recommend checking out imaging. It seems like a really neat software. I know next time I do a wedding, I'll be using this software. That's crazy. It's like your own personal assistant that knows how you edit and what exactly. edit the photos automatically. If you don't even have a style, you can use these other professional photographers' style if you like them as well. They also do culling. So, I mean, I'm sick of culling, but, you know, everyone has their, their kind of look that they're looking for. But they also have a culling, which is in the beta format. So, actually, you can, um, I think it's like unlimited beta culling at the moment, which is pretty cool. So, you kind of go through and you say hey, I want my pictures to be cold in a certain rating. You can pick labels such as stars, flags, and then you can also select if you want them to be less similar, similar, or very similar. Basically, you're saying, I want a lot of keepers or I want a little bit of keepers. Like if you have a variety of images that are very similar, you're going to say, give me the best three or just give me the best one. And then what the culling is actually doing, it's removing duplicate images, blinks, blurry images, and even photos with poor composition. So think about how much time this would save you if it picked out your top. Think about the headaches. Yeah, top that like saves you. 100 pictures of, of like, your event. We shouldn't be doing that as photographers. We should be doing the creative stuff. Right? Exactly. That gets rid of all the non-creative, technical, boring stuff. So once these are sorted, you can actually go through and resort it because maybe you did something that, you know, you're... Your um, AI didn't know it was a great picture, but you knew it was a great picture. So it's not, nothing's permanent. You could go back and look through and see if you want to add a couple images that maybe it missed. Um, but it's a really neat technology to check out.
Um, the way it works is you select your Lightroom catalog, you make a catalog with the images that you want, you drag them in, then it starts to use your filters and your culling preferences, and then it takes its time, and then and then you get the images that you wanted. So overall, it's a pretty fairly easy process. The hardest part is, is if you want to create your own AI preference of your style, it just means you have to find 3,000 images that you like the style of and upload those. I don't think that's that hard that's if you're really not that bad. Like, if you're like a wedding photographer or portrait yeah. photographer, I think that's pretty If you have easy. a system where you star your photos or something like that, you can load them up there and it's adaptive. So So that's Imogen. Next I want to move into Evoto. And actually I just learned about this at WPPI, which happened last week. I think it's a pretty neat software. It works with portrait retouching. Um, so if you're a portrait photographer, this is next level. So I used to use a software called Portrait Pro, which is similar to this, but I think Avoto has a couple more bells and whistles. Um, so let's say you had a portrait session. What's really cool is you can do everything. Well, these are the kind of things you can do. Portrait retouching, background, clean the background, color adjustment, sync your edits, and sky replacement. So that's kind of the basic things you can do. But let's dive into the portrait removal. The portrait. Um, so you can move blemishes, dark circles, all these things, which is great for portraiture and you want your models to look perfect. So with a couple clicks, it will remove these things and you can kind of say, I want a little bit or I want a lot of that kind of effect. Even sculpt their face, their eyebrows, their eyes, their nose, even create symmetry. Like that's pretty wild. Now, here's the thing to know too. I just used this with one of my students like yesterday and they were unbelievably happy with this like yeah. it works the thing to know is it just works really well like really well <laughs> what's cool about it is you know i think a lot of software that do these like face like softening and i you know enhancing all these things but what's really cool about a photo is it will do that in bulk um it will do it in bulk um batch batch <laughs> batch processing so instead of having to do each individual face you can actually say batch process this effect on all of my models which is really cool that is like a huge time saver this one i thought was really cool pretty fine teeth so you see this girl she's got like a little snaggle tooth you can even fix the snaggle tooth what <laughs> that's going to help me you should rename the filter <laughs> snaggle tooth fixer <laughs> Um, you can also add makeup. This would help me a lot in the morning. I wouldn't have to put on all this makeup. I would just use my stylish digital makeup. And lastly, body reshaping. No one needs to hit the gym anymore when you have a Voto. Just don't tell them. I promise you. <laughs> don't show the before and after. And then lastly, I don't know if you've ever been to a studio. It's very hard to maintain a white backdrop or a gray backdrop. There's always schmutz everywhere. This one will magically click the backdrop with just a simple click, which is amazing. If it did that and nothing else, I'd buy it. I know. Like it's the good. amount of effort that we also go through to right. get a perfectly white you take out, backdrop. You take out your backdrop. It's got wrinkles all down the front of it. And you're just like, man, that's going to take a, a like a... A lot of time post-processing, this cleans the backdrop. So easy peasy. Lastly, you can replace the sky. It's interesting. This picture is not the sky replace picture. I couldn't get it to hold. Uh, but you can take a sunset picture and whatnot and even make the reflections look like it's replacing the it's replaced as well. So you can get a full amazing sky and foreground replacement with the colors and make it look believable. Uh, lastly, you can use your sync edits, which I think is an incredible time saver if you want to sync it through your whole series and make everyone look perfect. Moving on, there's a software I also learned about called Radiant. It is an AI photo and video editor. Radiant improves every image by analyzing each image's unique composition. It adjusts individual pixels, ensuring harmonious color preservation and elevating image details and tones to unmatched levels. Open any image and immediately witness this. So I'm always like, yeah, this is going to be like every other software I've used. So I gave it a whirl. This is a picture we just took in, the Nor in Norway of this portrait session and instantly it opened up and it was stunning. I was so excited to see how it could just be instantly transformed. So instead of having to even hit auto, it just auto radiated radiated my picture um you can choose between landscapes people newborns babies even food and drinks there's kind of these presets that you can choose from and you can adjust it and it's not just doing what everyone else doing it's doing it in a pixel by pixel adjustment 
and it will learn how you do it, right? So it'll start editing the way you like it. But that pixel by pixel is something that I think it it needs a little clarity because what does that really mean? Like typically we're saying, all right, reduce the highlights, bring up the shadows, you have contrast, you have exposure, you have temperature, you have tint, you have all these sliders, great. But it's kind of like on this global level, right? And now at the first time, like you have an image software that's literally looking at every single pixel and recognizing, well, the pixels in the shadows need more noise reduction than the pixels in the highlights. Try doing that with any other software. You can't, right? Or the pixels in the skin need to be softened a little bit, but texture around the edges. It, it will recognize, so it has object AI. It recognizes whether it's a portrait versus a landscape. And it, on an individual pixel by pixel level, adjusting every single pixel to be its best is pretty remarkable. And that can't be understated. It's, it basically, it just works. And what's cool is it's free to try. So I would try it out if I were you. Um, what it does is scene detection. It uses AI to analyze each scene. So as soon as your picture loads, it'll know if it's a landscape or a portrait, and it'll give you an adjustment. There's smart presets that you can go ahead and select them. There's quick editing controls, so you can change the exposure if you want it to be a little bit different than it suggested. Um, also, the tones, the color, and the details can all be adjusted as well. So it's a great platform, and it even comes in an app for a phone um, if you wanted to put it on your phone and adjust your tools. But I just thought it was really easy and fun, and um, and it's a free trial right now that you can try out and see if you love it. And there's also the other thing, you know, since it's on a pixel-by-pixel -pixel level, it's not masking in the traditional sense. There's no halos, which is usually a problem with a lot of the software. There's, it, you know, where the edge, where the sky meets the landscape, for instance, or the, the skin meets the background. There's none. It's just like on a pixel perfect scenario adjustment. It's pretty cool. Lastly, they have some other enhancement tools, filter, portrait tools, color grading, and finishing tools. But what really brings it all home is, actually, before we move on, is it's actually made by photographers for photographers. So this is a Lila Cardi's project, and uh, he he is like a, he's an amazing, talented landscape photographer, amongst many other things. And he just wanted to create a tool that was for photographers, made by photographers. So everything and he is, did, and yeah. he did. Could not be a nicer guy. Extremely kind, talented, and he really put his heart and soul into this. And it shows. It's nice to see a photographer, rather than people thinking what photographers need, someone stepping up and saying, "This is what we need, and I'm going to build it." And I and I can see this constantly going to be improving too, like because he knows what we want. So yeah, um, it's great to be working with somebody who who understands what photographers want and need. Totally. totally. All right. Well, there's probably hundreds of other platforms and programs we could talk about, but we've run out of time. So just want to kind of wrap up and think through what is the future of editing and what does that look like. So I'm going to throw it to Cliff. What do you, what are a couple of things you think? So I think it's just going to get more convenient more fast, more faster. It's going to get faster, more intuitive. Uh, and I'm all for it. You know, right. that the skill, here's the thing. I teach us all day long, 40 to 60 hours a week, like Zoom, one-on-one -on -one private coaching calls, boot camps, retreats, all of it. And the details, I see where the pain points are. I see where people get hung up and making complicated selections, understanding dynamic range, checking the details and the shadows and all that what it's going to do is remove all of the, the technical detail side of it so we can actually focus on the things that matter, right? And what matters is the creative intention. What did you want to say? What's your vision? Understanding light, for instance, will never be removed from us. Right. And so like I showed you that, that image before from Norway where we push the light in from the right-hand corner and I let it scrape across the scene. We have better tools to help us further our understanding of light and convey that most effectively in an image that's never going to go away. So I think that a big part of it is going to make our jobs a little bit more intuitive, a little bit easier and faster, but allow us to refocus our creative energy on the creative application of what we want to say, not how we're going to say it. And I also think that the tools might change. I mean, with the advancement and of the um, of the Apple Vision Pro, like maybe we'll all be vision, doing editing in our glass in our glasses, like or in our Apple Vision Pro, looking into. I've you know, already done that. Yeah, pretty cool. And, and using our fingers to tap, or you know, we could even be doing three D and AR integration into our photos. So there's so many different things that the future of editing could be bringing. Even dynamic photos. So imagine you look at a photo and and you could tap on it and it could be interactive, like adding three dimensional virtual reality aspects could be really cool as well. 
Yeah. What I, what I, what I think would be cool, what I'd like to see that I think will happen is, so we saw the lens blur, right? We saw that understanding the depth of field in a scene, the Z axis. We're just a step away from relighting a scene in three dimensions. So when we put a light source in a photo for a portrait, for instance, it casts a shadow across the face in a very realistic way. Um, I think that's going to be really cool because we're already at a point, excuse me, where we can re-render a scene, make a 2D scene and make it 3D. That's effectively how this lens blur and some of the neural filters are already working. What I also think will be really cool is, and this is certainly going to happen. Um, so Alaya, I'll be talking to you next week, buddy. Um, like that, that, that girl, one of the models that we were shooting and she had a, a, a shirt on that I wanted to change the color of. We don't have to make a selection, go to the mask tool, find the person, isolate the shirt. We're just going to say, turn that shirt blue or make the skin a little bit brighter or give me a vignette, but not affect the subject. We'll just talk to it because of the natural language learning that's that's occurring everywhere right now. That will for sure lead into to? photography. Everybody, <laughs> anyone and everybody I possibly can, right? Um, but I think we'll be able to engage with these editing software in a different way. Replace the sky and I'll just replace it. Give me a sunset with the sun streaming from the right across the scene and do it out on our own photos and, and, and match the intent behind it. And it will learn how you like things to be adjusted. So I think the way we engage with the platform is going gonna, is gonna to shift radically soon. Awesome. And I think also AI generated content, which is going to be what we're talking about next week, uh, is also going to be a part of the future of editing. All right. Well, I think that kind of wraps up our editing uh, presentation. We have a lot more we could have shared. We're just out of time. This is Cliff and my information. We do want you guys to visit our site. Ooh, I guess it's not on here. Oh, here we go. Uh, the State of Photography AI Future of Photography site. Please scan this QR code. Join us. We're starting a community and we'd love for you to be a part of it. it so any questions that you guys have, basically, um, we're going to start kind of building this in public, so to speak. So rather than answer questions one by one via email, everything will be recorded. Right. So the, this conversation, for instance, everything will be recorded in a way that can be searched and referenced. Um, and basically all of our conversations, we can help you a lot further. And I love to just hear what you guys have to say about this, too. So we'd love to hear some feedback and and kind of build this together. And because we're all sort of in this together. Right. And let's face it. We're all facing the same the same uh, scenarios here. So I, I'd love to hear from you guys and, and hear your thoughts on the subject. Great. How do we put our face? Oh, yeah. If anyone has any, yep, next uh, next space is the April 18th. We'll be talking about a journey and all the other type of um, a journey. Um, all the text to text photo, to image text generator. To image generator. Yeah. Look forward to telling, sharing that more about that. And we appreciate your time today. Thank you for joining us. It's a lot of fun. Thank you, Cliff, for sharing all your expertise in editing. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate that. And thank you for all of your time. It's That's the most precious thing that we all have. So we appreciate you guys sticking through to us. And we're happy to be a resource however, however we can. See you in the next one. Take care.